We hear from a man who brings nearly a decade of IT leadership experience, most recently in his role as CEO of the Kmart Group, which includes Kmart and Target. He also held senior roles at Flybys, where he oversaw wholesale Amazon Web Services migration and implementation of Australia's largest Snowflake data platform. Now, Snowflake data, as you know, is data that can't handle criticism and bruises easily. Tough crowd, Adam, move on. Please welcome the Chief Information Officer of Kmart, Brad Blythe. Very much. Cheers. Yes, mate. Oh. One. Nice to meet you all. Thank you for having me. My name is Brad Blythe and I am the Chief Information Officer at Kmart Group. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with Kmart Group itself, so uh, there's three kind of major brands there, uh, Kmart, Target and Anchor. Hopefully you've heard at least one of those. Um, a little bit about myself, so I'm a software engineer by trade, uh, been in the IT industry uh, my entire career. Um, started off in robotics and manufacturing specifically, I thought robots were cool. Um, and that led me to some early kind of mobile app development through PDAs, if anybody remembers those, I'm probably showing my age there. Uh, and then went into kind of consumer grade app development, which then kind of journeyed into data and digital. I've worked across uh, marketing, financial services, loyalty, and now retail, which is uh, very exciting. So like I said, Kmart Group, um, if we just go to the next slide, sorry. Oh. Um, is those three brands, but today I'm going to primarily focus on, on Kmart and the Kmart story. So uh, has everybody heard of Kmart, been to Kmart? Yeah, put your hands up if you haven't been to Kmart. No? One? Yeah? Come see me after the show, I'll take you, and you'll walk out with 10 things you didn't even realise that you needed. <laughs> um, Kmart is a loved brand by Australians. And to give you an idea of just how much 85% of Australians have shopped Kmart in the past year, 27% of men, 36% of women have been there in the last week. Um, five, one out of five say it's their favourite shop and 60% associated with the lowest prices. So that's a really great reputation. We really pride ourselves on that. We have a purpose statement which is making our customers' everyday living brighter and we really try and stand by that. So the beauty of this affinity that we have with our customers is it really affords us the privilege and the trust to use their data through the consents that they give us. And so we've been on this two year journey to try and figure out how we leverage that data to really make their shopping experience better than it is. Um, and like I said, we, we've been on this two year uh, journey. Here's some stats, if you like, on, um, on some of our footprint. If you look under the tech stack, you would see something pretty simple. So we use Snowflake for data access and storage. We use Kafka for eventing. We use a lot of Power BI. And most of our models are built on Python. But we go through this three phase development cycle constantly between trying to understand the problems, establishing solutions. Once we think we've proven out our hypothesis, scaling that up, and then really trying to drive the value out of whatever we've built there. Now, we go through those constant three cycles. Each one of those steps comes with a particular set of challenges. So what I wanted to talk about today was some of the things that really unlocked or, or powered one of those pieces of the puzzle for us. So firstly, like all good tech organizations, the minute we got a, our access to some funding, we went off and started building things. And we had a very much a build it and they'll come mentality that we tried to push through. So imagine this, you're a software, you're a data engineer, you've just built the world's most amazing data model, uses thousands of data points, calculates some really deep insights, solves all the problems you could think of for the organization, crunches terabytes of data in milliseconds. All your friends, your engineering friends are super impressed. You kind of proudly present this piece of work that you've been slaving over back to your business, and the reaction is a bit, meh. That happened to us a lot in the early days. We really didn't get a lot of traction. And so we started thinking about, you know, what are we missing here? And really there was a communication problem. And you've heard a little bit about it today through some of the sessions. The people who had access and could build the solutions didn't really understand the problems. The people who had the problems didn't really understand what was possible. 
And so we really played with this, okay, centralized, decentralized, we've got this single team over here. And we thought that that's what we needed, but we were just kind of playing with the idea of how much do we push back into the organization? How much ownership do we kind of give them to kind of come up with some of the things that we need to build? And we introduced this concept of a data translator. So there's a lady in the room today, Anna Roy, I don't know if she wants to put her hand up. Yes, Anna, uh, who really helped foster this capability for us. She's not on the market, just in case you're wondering. Um, and really what the data translator's job to do, they sit in an area of our organization. We've seated them in our top three operational areas for us, which is online, stores and merchandise. They understand that area of the organization. They really, they're close to the p and they're close to the problem spaces, and they have the necessary skills to kind of articulate it in a way where we can start solutioning and come up with hypothesis of how we could pro potentially problem solve this. We've got 10 of them today, and the minute we put them in, something amazing happened. There was an unlock. We had a 400% growth in three months in our backlog. So this is all the ideas that we collected, potential things that we could chase and actually generate value with. And for each single one of those, we noticed a dramatic increase in the amount of benefit that we thought that we could go after. So this really helped drive that establishment piece. We had a test and learn hypothesis cycle starting to play out there. And it was really powered by the introduction of this tr data translator role. So now we had this full backlog. We were pretty happy with that. We had all this great work coming in, um, but we had a scale issue. So, you know, we had a single team and the way, the way it kind of worked was we'd get the hypothesis, a requirement, they would go away, they would build a report, they would come back and they would say, here your report. Typically that would be, yeah, it's 80% there. Can you do this? Can you do that? And there was a bit of back and forth. And we just weren't keeping up with the demand. It would have been impossible for us to get where we wanted to get to. In the time that we wanted to get there, just due to the fact that we couldn't scale the team quick enough. So I don't know if anybody's tried to hire anybody recently. How's that going for you? It's a bit tough out there. But the amount of people that we would have needed to get to where we wanted to get to wasn't attainable at the time. So we stood back a little bit and we tried to move our service model to a self-service model. What this meant was we had to go back, we had to look at our architecture. We had to put in some controls. We had to put in some new tooling. We had to put in some guidelines. We had to, the data translator function started to educate and upskill areas of our organization. And we focused the data team and refocused them, sorry, on being a data platform team, not necessarily just a solutions team. We started building different things. So we didn't build, concentrate so much on building reports. We started concentrating on building cubes, data serving layers, data catalogs, giving them the correct access to the things that they needed. That really then grew the usage, the return on investment on the platform. We were building less stuff to get the value. So there was, a, there was an increase in the ROI from the tech build that we were seeing. The other thing that it also helped to address was the recruitment challenges. We needed less people to get to where we wanted to get to. And on top of that, people were exploring. So the things that they thought in terms of reports, they were getting more value out of because they were kind of experimenting and playing with the data, generating insights they didn't even know that they needed. So that was another unlock for that scaling piece for us. The faster horses. So now that we, we stood back, we were pretty happy with ourselves at this stage. We've got ideas coming in. We're building things. People are using them. But when we stood back and had a look at some of the things that we were building, we were turning a lot of Excel spreadsheets into Power BI reports. What's even more interesting is when they take the Power BI information, they put it back in the Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> and then when you ask them why they're doing that, well, I need my macros. And that's not a dieting term. That's just them manipulating the data inside the Excel spreadsheet rather than trying to correct the problem in its source. So we were doing quite a bit of that at the moment. So this is where something interesting changed and we did a bit of an experiment. So we had one report that we took. It was our store rostering report. This is a report that helps store managers understand who they need to roster for shifts. Pretty straightforward, but REM and store costs are one of our biggest cost centers. So 
this report uses some basic uh, data points to help them, like I said, shape their, their rosters for the week and their staff. Now, we took that example, and then we tried to create an automated decisioning engine on top of it. So we tried to see if we could be smarter than the store managers. Now, keep in mind these store managers, A, are accountable for this. If they get the roster wrong, then that goes towards their KPIs. Um, and B, they've been doing it for a long time, so they're pretty good at it, to be honest. The thing with a, when you do an automated decisioning engine or a model, it is way more complex than, um, than something that you could possibly put in a report anyway. So the particular uh, model that we bought, uh, that we used, used thousands of data points, something that wasn't actually comprehensible in a Power BI report. It managed to consider trends across individual stores, industry trends, as well as individual trends on the actual staff. It, uh, it managed to have um, a feedback loop so that it could actually correct itself on some of the decisions that it was making over time. And when we put this in place, it did, we didn't run a learning cycle for very long. We basically put it in place and, and used some historical data and we saw a 6% improvement in accuracy. 6% might not sound like a lot. It equates to roughly about $4 million. But to give you an idea, this is 6% without any real run-throughs, without any real learnings. So we've consequently run it, or have kept running it, and that 6% is increased. And the takeaway for me from this one was, we, had, we were already getting value, but now that value automatically increased over time. We didn't have to do anything extra for that. We'd invested in and we built something where the value increase was unlocking itself. And that was the thing that's really driving some of that value increase. So they were some of the key points for us through those three stages that really helped us unlock and continually go through and pass through those three steps. The last thing I think worth touching on is probably just four questions. And it sounds like we're gonna hear a lot more about these as you go through as well. But four questions that we constantly ask ourselves as we go on this journey. The question of data quality versus data quantity. Everybody wants a lot of data. And so for a long time, the more data you have, the better your model is. And to a certain extent, that's true. But sometimes it's worth asking the question, is there a simpler way to do it? Is a higher quality data element better than many lower quality data elements? The one that comes to mind a lot is when people are going through, they're doing a location-based algorithm and they're looking at customer addresses and they might have three or four customer addresses, a delivery address, profile address, loyalty address. And I can guarantee you at least one of those is wrong. Whereas if they're looking for last shopped location or something that's where an action's actually happened, the accuracy on that is typically much higher and would lead to a better outcome. So it's always worth asking yourself, is there a simpler way to do this? Is there something that I'm not factoring into the way I'm building these things that factors quality as an indication of how good my model is. The other one is data proxies. So data proxies, essentially a non-related or non-direct data element, but it can be used to derive a similar outcome or insight. So maybe a really basic example of this is um, if anybody's watched uh, National Geographic or a nature show where they use the tree rings to, to basically estimate the age of a tree. It's not the actual age of a tree, but it's an indicator, it's a proxy for the age of a tree. Um, there's multiple examples where you can use data proxies to have a much better outcome. Two that I've worked on in my career, so one was in insurance. This is car insurance, so if anybody's ever filled out a car insurance form, this was going back maybe 10 years ago. It's a lot better than it was back then, but they're pretty evasive. You know, how old are you? Where do you live? When this, what's the last time you had an accident? What kind of car do you drive? What side of the bed do you get up on? Lots and lots and lots of questions. When we took that model, we tried to find a simpler way to get the same amount of, um, essentially a similar outcome on how, how much risk was involved per, um, per applicant. And that would then derive back into your premiums. But we found a way to do it with one question. And again, this was car insurance, which is how many car tires have you bought in the last 12 months? That one question was more accurate than all the other questions. 
If you're buying a lot of car tires, chances are you're doing a lot of burnouts or you're driving a lot, more time on road. That would therefore mean that the chances, the likelihood of you being involved in a car accident was significantly higher. Again, much more accurate than all of the other questions. Another one that we worked on um, was around credit risk for small businesses. We were trying to, and this is like cafes and coffee shops and pizza shops, we were trying to figure out exactly you know, what kind of credit risk, what was the right amount of lending to, to give to some of these businesses. If anybody knows anybody with a small business like this, they're not typically very good at bookkeeping, uh, maybe for obvious reasons. Um, and what we were trying to figure out is how could we leverage another data point that gave us a similar metric or a better accuracy of what a credit risk of a small business was. We started with pizza shops. And what we figured out was if we knew uh, exactly how much cheese that pizza shop had bought and used, we could actually tell how profitable they were. We call it the pizza cheese index. Um, and that was a better indication of profitability rather than the other pieces. Just over time, so we're going to move quickly through the others. Biases, you definitely have biases in your model somewhere. You need to ask yourself, are they negatively impacting your customer? A really common one is address equals affluence. Where you live indicates how rich or poor you are. Not always true, not always accurate, and can lead to a worse outcome for customers. Ethics and culture, question to ask yourself, is it your data or is it your customers? The way you answer that question in your organization will determine the behaviors and some of the things you do around your data. So it's worth asking the question. That's all from me, I'm over time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brad.